Okay, here we go. Episode 11. Time to ride the carousel, guys. Here we go. Okay, so you got a King's Indian attack. Pretty standard so far. D3. Knight D2. E4. Take. Take. All fine so far. Pretty standard. What should white do here? What should white do here? Well, let's ask ourselves what is black threatening? Black is threatening this pawn because he's attacking it twice. We're defending it once. So it seems logical to defend it again. So what's the correct way? Well, unfortunately, it's not rookie one because knight takes e4 wins a pawn. Tactics, guys. This rook is overworked. It's defending the queen and the knight. So after knight takes e4, queen takes queen, rook takes queen, bishop takes e4, we just lost the pawn. Okay, but that's not the end of the story. That's not the end of the story because what happens in this position if white plays knight e5? So the idea is that we are trying to create a pin on this g2 a8 diagonal. So for example, if he takes our knight on d2, we would take on b7 first, and then this knight on d2 is trapped, and also the rook on a8 is trapped, so we'd win material. So what should black do here? Black do here. Queen d4, knight d6. Reasonable. Reasonable. But incorrect. The right answer is knight takes f2. Now the point is that this king is very unsafe. And notice that this bishop is blocked off. So after king takes f2, bishop c5 check. check. Now all of a sudden this king is starting to look very unsafe. And after a move like king f1, black has queen d4. And now queen f2 mate is a threat, and if rook e2, queen g1 mate. Checkmate. So that wouldn't be good. So this knight takes f2 tactic works in these positions sometimes when white doesn't have good control over the dark squares. And that is the case in this position because this knight on d2 blocks off this bishop on c1. So always be careful of those types of tactics. So rook e1 is not the correct way to defend this pawn. The correct way is to play queen e2 for many reasons. Uh, well, first off, it doesn't actually hang a pawn, but more importantly, this rook often wants to come to d1 and gain play on the d-file. And so you're, you're freeing your rook to come to its natural square. At the very least, you're, you're freeing this rook if you want to come to the d-file, if you want to keep this rook on the e-file. So it just makes sense to put the queen on e2. And notice that bishop a6 doesn't do anything because we can just play c4. And black basically just wasted a move here. Okay, but white played rook e1. And, and now, of course, black should take on e4, but black didn't notice. Okay. So, 
White was let off the hook a bit. What should White play now? So one of the key moves in this King's Indian attack, if you can get it in, is this move e5. Okay, so what does this move do? Well, it does a lot, actually. It, first of all, opens up this bishop. Second of all, it creates a pawn on this e5 square. It forces this knight off of its natural f6 square. It also cramps black. This bishop now is not as strong. And it provides a potential outpost on d6. Notice that black has moved his pawn away from c7, so now d6 is a potential outpost. So e5 would make a lot of sense. So for example, after knight d5, the knight e4, now we're eyeing this d6 outpost. We're going to follow up with potentially moves like queen e2, rook d1, c4, knight d6, and this pawn is actually quite a problem for white, or for black, sorry. Uh, eventually a bishop f4 to kind of prophylactically overprotect. And then hopping a knight into d6 will give black no end of problems. So e5 is very thematic in the King's Indian attack, so e5 would have been a good move here. Uh, unfortunately, white plays this move knight to c4. Uh, so notice what is wrong with knight c4. Well, again, simple tactics. Two is better than one. And really, two is better than zero. Because after queen takes, rook takes, you can take on e4 for nothing. So again, always be asking yourself, what are your pieces defending? Knight c4 is a thematic move, but you need to have this pawn on e5 first. OK, so black again decides he doesn't like free pawns. And so again, what should white play here? Not a trick question. Because the answer will be the same as it was the last move. So again, this pawn's attacked. Again, we want to be thematic. So again, e5 is a good move. I'm glad you guys are so excited and confident because it's absolutely correct gets our pawn off of the square it's attacked on, and it's also just a good move. But of course, white plays c3. And so for the third time, this pawn is now hanging. The first time less obvious, the second time more obvious. This time it's super obvious. So black doesn't take it. Doesn't take it. So white has not been saved once, not twice, but now three times. Okay, it's not so simple though, because what is black threatening? Black has two threats. Black has two threats. What are black's two threats? So black is threatening to simply take our rook, and this pawn that's been hanging for the past few moves it, it is still is still hanging. So what should white do? Should white save his rook for, for the cost of the pawn? Should white save his pawn for the cost of the rook? Should he just ignore both? Should he try to save both? Can he save both? What the heck should he do? What the heck should he do? Okay, so notice that in this position, there are tricks. There are tricks. So for example, rook takes rook, rook takes rook, e5 loses the game because of rook d1 check. Check. And now if you block with the knight, I win, I take with check. But if you block with the bishop, don't forget I have this. And this is hopeless because bishop e2 is coming and this bishop is dead. So that 
is no bueno. So you can't just take the rook and play e5 because you have back rank issues. Okay, if you play rook e1, don't forget I can just take on e4. Winning a pawn. Easy peasy. Um, bishop g5. Again, I can simply take a pawn. Easy peasy. No issues. So, should we just sacrifice the pawn? Is, is that what we're... Is that what we're resorting to now? Sacrificing a pawn for the greater good? I mean, it could be the best choice. But no. When, when asked to play defense, you play defense. Defense. Ch -ch defense. So how do we play defense here? How do we play defense here? Knight d2 doesn't quite work, because don't forget, this is still a pin. Still a pin. So we can simply take on e4. So, doesn't quite work yet. Does not quite work yet. We could also actually take this way as well if we want. But the right answer is a combination of both. So we want to play rook takes d8, rook takes d8, and now, and now, knight fd2. We're playing some defense now. So we got this pawn defended how many times? Well, it's defended twice. It's attacked twice. 2 equals 2, fine for us. And notice that this pawn on c3 keeps this knight out of c b4. This knight really has no future, this bishop kind of sucks. We're going to play e5 next move, get our pieces out eventually, and actually white is perfectly fine here. But it requires some defense. You can't, we can't play offense all the time. White having played three bad moves in a row, we can't anticipate that we're going to be start having to play attacking moves after that. But white is perfectly able to defend this position. It just requires a bit of, a bit of trickery. Taking the rook first to alleviate the pin, and then knight d2. Knight fd2. Sorry. Okay, but white was too clever for all that and played bishop e3, saying, well, if you're not going to take my pawn three times, you probably won't take my pawn four times. Was he right? Well, of course not. I mean, uh, he, even a blind squirrel finds a nut eventually. So, four times were, were not enough. Black was able to take the pawn. Alright, so we're down a pawn. Not the end of the world. Not the end of the world. Okay, so rook d2, preparing to double, take, knight c takes, bishop g6. Okay, so we're down a pawn, but, I mean, we don't really have any other problems other than the fact we're down a pawn. We have all our minor pieces, we have a rook, our minor pieces look fine, our pawns look fine. Oh, we'll get to you, Yerand. We will get to you, sir. Don't worry about it. I have, I have a whole Potter's Playground devoted to you. Don't worry about it. But let's get to the task at hand. So we're down a pawn. Not the worst in the world. So in these types of positions, you kind of want to make things difficult for your opponent. So, you know, offering trades is not making things particularly difficult. You know, keep, keeping everything kind of status quo is not really making things difficult. We want to try to create some sort of imbalance that we can play with. So right now we have all the minor pieces on the board. What can white do to maybe try to create an imbalance to work in his favor? So what should white play here? Yeah, very good. Very good. 95. Okay, so what's the point of this move? What does it threaten? And again, when I say threaten, I don't mean necessarily that you're winning material or anything, but something it can do. So what's the idea of 95?
Okay, well, one thing we are threatening is to take the two bishops. Which also, conveniently enough, uh, does give black doubled pawns. And notice that black's pawn majority is on the king side. So we are threatening to cripple his pawn majority. So notice now that if we get some sort of pawn ending, this, this could be potentially drawn. Because if black can't create a pass pawn on the king side, uh, th this could be drawn. But what else are we threatening here? We're actually threatening to win our pawn back with this move knight to c6 because we're forking this and we're forking this. And it's actually very tough for for black to defend this pawn. Very tough. Well, almost impossible actually. I think the only move black has here to defend that pawn would be to play knight b8. And after knight b8 we can simply take on g6 and we have the two bishops, so we can actually play for something. Maybe a4, a5 to kind of get our rook active, something like that. But notice that it's kind of hard to stop knight c6 and then take on a7, because it's, it's, it's hard to move this pawn because the knight's in front of it, and it's hard to defend this pawn, because notice this bishop controls this a8 square. So after knight c6, if the rook goes to a8, you can do some sort of discovery, like knight e7 check or something, and then take the rook on a8. Okay, so what did our what did our Potter do? Well, he played ninety five. Pretty good. Pretty good. So black plays knight d five. And now, what should white play? Anybody? 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 Yep, yeah, very good. Knight c6. Okay, so what is white's threat here? Can someone tell me what white's threat is after knight c6? True. Good point, 15 hats. If knight takes e3, we take on e7 with check. Then we can take on g6 with check. Then we can take on e3. True. But what are we actually threatening in this position? We're not really threatening knight takes e7. But we are threatening something. What are we threatening? Yeah. So what's defending this guy? Well, it's this guy. Can we attack this guy? Well, we are attacking it. So we're threatening to take this guy, remove the defender, and then take on e7. So in all likelihood, black would probably move his bishop to a square, say f6. And now our plan would be realized because we can simply take on a7 and get our pawn back. If we wanted to, we could take on d5 first. Whoops, take on d5 first. Doesn't really matter. But okay, at least we get our pawn back. What did white do though? He took on g6. Okay. So he didn't decide to win his pawn back, but okay, he did get the two bishops for himself. And he also managed to cripple the pawn structure. Okay, so take. Knight c4, okay. Getting his knight into the game makes sense. His bishop was kind of stuck, though. Okay, black took the bishop off, so now no more two bishops. But notice it's opposite color bishop, potentially. So it gives white some more drawing chances if he can trade pieces. Knight takes, he doesn't want to ruin his pawn structure, it makes sense. Rook d8. Okay. So now what should white do? What should white do now? Well now is the point 
we have to ask yourself, what is Black's threat? So what's Black's threat here? What is Black's threat? Rook d2 looks pretty menacing. But that's not his threat. His threat is actually nothing. His threat is actually precisely nothing. Because say we make a move that does nothing. Say we pass, play h3. Rook d2, knight c4, covering b2, attacking the rook. And we got 12.01 lag, so give me 30 seconds until the arrows show up. And I will show you some more things. Okay, and if rook c2, bishop e4, rook only has one square, bishop d3, and all of a sudden, what happened? Well, the rook trapped itself. The rook trapped itself. So, in this position, black's threat is nothing. So, so this is super important, guys. Super important. Rook d2 looks really menacing. I will grant you that. But some simple calculation will tell you that he's actually threatening nothing. And so if he's threatening nothing, you just want to improve your position. And so Yeran's move, king f1, is absolutely correct. Oops. So forget about h3. Yeah, so ghost threats, that's one of the main reasons why amateurs make weak moves. Because they respond to threats that don't, ex don't even exist. So simply king f1, king e2, and black can't make any use of this file. Now it's possible you do want to trade rooks eventually, but why not improve your king position first? Because again, black can't do anything with owning the file. And notice after king f1, say, black plays b5 or something. Now we're in time, right? King e2, and now we're in time to stop the rook from penetrating. So, okay. Um, white, of course, was afraid of ghosts, so he uh, offered a rook trade. Check. Which black happily accepted. So now this is actually a little bit tricky to, to draw, but Again, the fact that they're opposite color bishops gives white some chances. So, okay, what, what should white do here? What's rule number one of end games? We mentioned it already, but now without the rooks on the board, it's even clearer. Yeah, very good king position. So we wanna, we wanna get the king this way maybe. Okay, I'm not sure why white's playing knight e3. I mean, improving the position of the knight is okay too, but there's really no place that the knight's gonna go that's gonna really influence black, so king position will be important. Okay, so again, bring the king in. Again, I'm not sure why bishop c6. I guess he was trying to stop black's king from coming to e8, but I mean, the king can come on the dark squares. So again, getting his own king to the game would have been preferable. Okay. So now in this position, what pieces does white want to trade? What piece does he want to trade for what piece? Remember, white's trying to draw this because he's down a pawn. So what two pieces would white want to trade in this position? Yeah, so white would want to trade this guy for this guy. True. Because again, opposite color bishops would make the draw easier to hold. But any any bishop versus knight ending or knight versus bishop ending will be tough. Will be tough. Possible but tough. So white embarks on this incorrect idea to exchange the knight for the bishop. And even though there are pawns on both sides of the board, you think the bishop is stronger than the knight, but because he's down a pawn, this knight can attack pawns on 
both colors, so it's gonna be tough. Yeah. Secondarily, white also wants to trade as many pawns as possible. That's absolutely true. Because the more pawns that are traded, the harder it will be for black to actually uh, actually promote a pawn. But yeah, a knight trade would be good, but pawn trade would also help. But okay, so he plays knight g4 with the idea to take on f6. Okay, not the best. But again, it's not hopeless yet. Okay, well now it's getting closer to hopeless. Now it's getting closer to hopeless. Because he, he, he shouldn't be wanting to push pawns on the side of the board where black has the majority. Because it'll just make it easier for black to create a pass pawn. So for example, after g5, it almost forces that this pawn is going to become passed. Whereas if he keeps his pawn on f2, it's much harder for black to force through his majority. But by pushing his pawns forward, now it makes it very easy for black. So king f5, king f2. So black can play e5 here, just trade pawns, create a pass pawn, whatever. Okay, f6. Okay, then all of a sudden, what's happening guys? All of a sudden what's happening? Well, out of nowhere, it's mate in three. Can you believe it? Mate in three, guys. Would you have noticed it if I didn't tell you? Simply mate in three. This king got a little too fancy for his own, for his, for his own good. But white has mate in three. Right? Okay, so when you see this king running short on squares, you have to ask yourself if there's some way you can punish yourself. So do you guys see where how white can mate in three? Starts with a quiet move. But we need we need to weave the mating net. We need to weave the mating net. So how do we weave it? Well we need to stop the king from coming this way. So king f3 is the first move. Which white played? So now it's mate in two. Mate in two. All right. So now where's the mate in two? So now the king's threatening to escape this way. So we have to cut off that escape. So how do we do that? Well, we play bishop d7 check. Check. And then knight e6. And this is checkmate. Checkmate. As the nice lady says. Okay, what did white play here? Did white find the mate in two? Well, of course not. Check. Of course not. Okay. But it's still instructive because this is a draw. Check. This is a draw. White got his pawn back, which is good. And now the bishop is actually better than the knight, but again, it's going to be a draw. Or is it? Or is it? So what should white play here? The twists and turns in this game will never end. Okay, so end game for rule, where, where should white go? He's in check. So he has three legal moves. Sorry, two, yeah, three legal moves. So where, his, where should his king go? Well, he should wanna keep the king as far advanced as possible. So I move like king e4, right? Because there's no other checks that, that black has. And so not only opposition, but just keeping the king on the fourth rank would make sense. But he plays king f3, which is odd, because now he lets black play king e5. So you, you don't want to cede ground unless you have to. And here white's kind of giving black <clears throat> more control. So black takes it. Bishop b4, knight c7, bishop d3. And now white gets this idea to kind of march this king this way, which is fine. Okay, so he, he's making some progress, but this should still be a draw. Uh, what should black play here, guys? He 
in order to secure said draw. Yeah. So the problem is this king is starting to come here, but black can actually construct the perfect fortress with knight f8. And now notice that this pawn stops this, this knight stops this, this pawn stops this. And notice what is what color square is every piece that black owns? What color? All on black. So now basically white or black can just shuffle back and forth forever. Just play king e6, king e5, king e6, king e5, king e6, king e5, king e6, king e5 forever. And white can shuffle king g4, king h5, king g4, king h5. And it's a draw. This bishop is lovely, it's just a ghost bishop. Just a ghost bishop. Did white did black play knight f8? Well, I mean, we're we're dealing with the carousel here. It's not going to be a chance. And well, plays knight f8. Oh, he did. Well, then it's just a draw. Bishop c2. And now again, just king e6, king e5, king e6, king e5. Did black play king e6, king e5, king e6, king e5? Well, black's on the seesaw, so of course he didn't. Played f5, and now he's dead lost. Now he's dead lost. Why? Why is black dead lost? Well, he's starting to put his pieces on, on the wrong color, right? So, okay, king g5. Okay, so now the only way to defend this pawn is to play g6. Okay, and now how does white win? Now how does white win? So actually even stronger than h5, which probably is losing? Or maybe drawing? Well, maybe it's winning. And yeah, maybe h5 take, you take on f5. Yeah, maybe it's winning. But the stronger idea is actually simply to get this bishop to f7. And then simply play bishop takes g6, and then queen is pawn. So bishop b3. And notice now how black cannot stop this. You cannot stop me. So king e4, bishop f7, king g3, take, take. And now what should white play here? This is very geometrical, very picturesque. Very nice technique from white to finish this game. Now what does white play here? So h5 gives gives black a glimmer of hope. Because he can start running this guy. But bishop f5, and now notice, a key concept of bishop versus knight on games, domination. This knight is officially dominated. Officially dominated. Can't go here, can't go here, can't go here, can't go here. This king is completely shut out as well. It's going to take it 63 moves to get around. It has to go like here and 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 here. So about 65 moves. And in that time, I will have made several queens. So let's see how white finishes it out. It's very nice actually. H5, H... He played king F6. So the idea is he just simply wants to win the knight first. And very nice. So notice if he plays a move like h6 right away and then h7, this actually gives black great drawing chances. Because after take, Check. take, now all of a sudden this king is running quickly and eating uh, white's pawn. So white can probably erect some sort of blockade and win still, but it's much more messy. And it's entirely possible it's even a draw. But white played the correct idea to just simply win this knight first, because again, it's stuck. So no matter where it moves, you're just going to take it, then queen the pawn. And with the queen to the good, white should win. And indeed, black resigned here. So, even though white missed mate in two, he still won the game. After some trials and tribulations, I would say. Let's take a look at one more before we sign off. 
Okay, here we go. Another game from the white side. Okay, we got a, a little Vienna. A four. Okay. So E takes F4. Notice that this move that black plays is actually not great. So why is, why is this move not great? Why is this move not great? Well, you're basically helping white develop, right? But also, how many center pawns? How many center pawns does white have? And how many center pawns does black have? So you're basically letting white have a free reign in the center. But yeah, you're also helping white develop. So correct here would just be knight c6, and it's about equal. But okay, so take, take, good. Bishop g7. Okay, so what should white do here? You might think this question is simple, but given what white played in the game, I need to ask it. I need to ask it. Yep. Knight f3 makes a lot of sense. Sure. Yep. Develop is good. Okay. So. The move, the move that white chose is a move that was designed to stop this idea. And so for some reason white was afraid of this. So why is this move not something that white should worry about? Again, threats, phantom threats. So white didn't want to be forced to taking this with a pawn. And so what, why should white not be worried about that? Right, like, uh, so say white just makes a nothing move, like h3 or something. So after Check. take and take, n notice how weak these dark squares are. And notice how actually this pawn helps strengthen our center. We control d4 now. And we also get this half open b file to play on. So this actually, is something that we wouldn't mind at all. We'd actually want him to. Yeah, queen h4, I play g3. Don't worry, Arthur. I see you, I see you. But okay. All right, so uh, unfortunately, in this position, white, white played a, a move, again, chasing ghosts. He played bishop d2. So notice that this move kind of violates everything, right? You're, you're undeveloping a piece that was well posted. You're responding to something that doesn't actually exist. So these are the types of moves you want to strive to avoid at all costs, because these really are the type of moves that make your game go south very quickly. Because you're basically losing, in effect, two tempo by playing a move like this, right? And two tempo in the opening is, is not good. Not good. Okay. So c5. Okay, developing better. Queen me six. Okay. Now again, we have to ask the famous question, what is black's threat? What is black's threat? <laughs> Nothing. Okay, I'm not gonna let you off that simple. I'm not gonna let you off that simple. The question is, why is it nothing? Give a concrete variation to support. Poison pawn, yes, but why is it poisoned? There's a, there's a very specific reason why it's poisoned that you should be able to see. So you, you can't just think, oh, you know, black doesn't have a threat because, okay, I've seen positions like this where if he takes a pawn, it's not fun for him. You have to see a very specific reason why queen takes b2 is not good. How strong can one get with a much open theory? Uh, pretty strong. If you're pretty good tactically, you can be pretty good. You'd probably be like 1800 without much opening knowledge whatsoever. 
Okay. Very good, guys. Very good. So the reason why this isn't a threat is, say I play a move like bishop e2, queen takes b2, rook b1. Okay, now the queen only has one square. Only has one square, a3. And now we play this move knight b5. And notice we're forking the queen, and we're forking a fork. Forking a queen and a fork. And notice the queen cannot get back to defend this square because queen a5 is attacked. So he can take on a2, of course, but we fork the fork and win everything and black and resign. Okay. So we notice that this is actually not a threat at all. So given that, what should white play? What should white play? So a simple developing move would be good. And I award partial credit for a move like bishop e2. But you actually have something stronger here. And the stronger idea is knight d5. And you might ask yourself, well, this looks a little silly. I mean, yes, I'm attacking the queen and gaining a tempo, but I mean, what does my knight really do on d5? Well, it does stuff. So the queen has to keep defending this square. Notice that if queen c6, there's little tricks like d4, take, and bishop b5. I guess I've seen this before. Wins the queen. Because if queen takes b5, knight c7, Check. I fork every piece you own. So usually queens on c6 are not well posted. So more prudent after knight d5 would be queen d8. And now what should white do? Good. Gain another tempo on the queen. Okay, the queen's starting to feel a little unsafe. So knight f6. And now what? d4 would be, or sorry, bishop e2 would be good, but actually we can play an immediate d4. And the idea is we simply want to play e5 and win a piece. Yeah, knight f6 and bishop h6 is also good. But this is pretty strong too because if you take I can take on d4 and all of a sudden I'm triple attacking this guy and it's not looking pretty but okay bishop b2 is fine as well but our hero played rook b1 of course because he likes defending against phantom threats so follower guessed it incorrectly rook b1 was the way he defended all right knight f6 bishop b2 okay he's developing C4. Okay. How should white respond to C4? Let's see if you guys know the correct follow up. Just take it or wait. Okay, well, castling is illegal, unfortunately. Castling is illegal. But yeah, d4 is much stronger. Much stronger. Because notice that now we're threatening this. The queen is no longer attacking g1, so we are safe to castle. Because notice after a move like pawn takes pawn, knight g4 would be a bit annoying. With uh, 
mates on the horizon, this bishop also kind of looming. So you have to be a little careful. But d4 is definitely correct, and our hero did play d4, so kudos. Knight g4. Okay, I'm not really sure what that does. I guess hitting d4. Bishop takes c4. This is an excellent move. Excellent move. Because even though black is taking on d4, uh, he actually has nothing here. Because after bishop takes d4, knight d5 is a fantastic move. Fantastic. Because notice that black actually has no threats. So even though this looks 100 times scarier, in my opinion, than either of black's previous two, two quote-unquote threats, now all of a sudden white suddenly becomes Mr. Ghostbuster and just disregards everything. Correctly, of course, but still, it's rather mystifying. So, uh, so what happens? So, so why should white not fear anything here? Yeah, so if knight f2, how, what's the simplest thing? I mean, don't forget we're attacking this guy, so. Simplest thing would probably just be to take the queen, take the queen, and take the rook. We're just up a rook for nothing. This is hanging, this is hanging, everything's hanging. We're up for millions of points of material. Uh, you're saying knight f2 on move 11? Uh, can I just take it? Free piece? And you want to take on d4? Check. Now I just play king f1. Now I'm just up a piece for nothing. I don't have to take here, by the way. Not mandatory. I mean, I could. But not mandatory. Uh, yeah. And of course, if bishop f2, Check. like in the game, what should white play here? Yeah, simply the smooth, suave king f1. No worries. And white's completely winning here. Because all of black's pieces are suddenly very tenuously guarded. Okay, so his queen's hanging, he has to do something about that. So he's queen c5. Okay, so what is black's threat? Black actually does have a threat now. I know. I know the theme of this posture's playground has been lack of threats, but he does have a threat. What's his threat? No, his threat is not h3. Ask yourself what black's threat is. Yeah, his threat is to simply take our bishop. Which is not good. So what should we do about it? What should we do about it? Bishop to s b5? No, because I can take it. Don't check. forget. Check. That's check. That's check. You don't have time for this. Don't forget. Don't hang pieces. Yeah. So again, attack and defense. Attack and defense. Or in this case, defense and development. So we want to defend this with development. Queen e2. Correct. Good. Our hero played b3. Not as good. Not as good. Because something is going to come about in a few moves. I don't know if you guys can spot it yet. It's it's a little it's a little hard to see from this position, but there are a couple of white's pieces that are precariously placed. I don't know if you guys can figure out which two they are, but they're important ones. And there'll be some tactics involving them soon, which Queen E2 would have avoided. It's hard to see from this position, but we'll get a little bit closer and you guys will see what I'm talking about. Okay, bishop b6. So again, white should play queen e2 here. 
to avoid some of the ideas I'm talking about because after knight g5, uh, how does black save himself here? Because notice that black's actually not down material in this position. Notice that black's actually not down material. Did white have h3 and bishop before? No. Because I can take on d5 first. Yeah, and also knight e3, yep. Okay. So what should black do here? Well, black should actually initiate mass exchanges. Knight e3 check. check. Knight takes e3, bishop takes e3, bishop takes e3, queen takes e3, bishop takes e6, pawn takes e6, knight takes e6, and now king e7. And black is fine. Because this knight can't move because of rook f8. And we're threatening queen takes e4. And so black's just going to get his pieces out and be fine. So probably like knight d4, rook f8, knight f3, queen takes e4, and black's fine. Okay. But black played bishop h4. Okay, queen f3. Bishop takes g5. Bishop takes g5. Okay, now what should black play here? This is this is his last chance for equality. Both kings are not happy at the moment. White's king is on f1, black's king is without a dark squared bishop to save it. So neither king is particularly happy. But how can black kind of mend together his position a bit? Yeah, well, don't forget, though. Don't forget, there's problems. Yeah, you, you have dark squared issues, light squared issues, all sorts of issues. So the key square you have to defend is actually this square. You have to defend f6. You found self made in 3? Well, I'll give you a hint. Black found self made in 3 himself as well. So Bla Black found it. You, you, don't, you weren't the only one to find it. But yeah, knight d7 is best here, just to protect this square. And then h3, knight e5. And here it's roughly equal. Uh, white has the two bishops, but neither king is particularly happy in this position. Neither king is particularly happy. Okay, well, that's almost exactly what happened. Check. So knight e3, I, I don't know what this is. I mean, suddenly black just hangs every piece he owns. So this is defended three times, attacked once, so take. Okay, now... Strong move from white. I hope you guys all see it. Bet you didn't see this self in 3. Bet you didn't see this one. Queen f6, of course. Very strong. Threatening this. Threatening this. <clears throat> now I'm sure Zibit can guess what black played here. Didn't see this self self in 3. So, of course, black castled. And now, and now, mate in one. So what did white play? What did white play? Mate in one. Horsey thingy, horsey thingy to the square. Horsey hops, horsey hops mate. Well, you're all wrong. You're all wrong.
Because White didn't mate. White did not mate. And White did not even play bishop h6. He did not even play bishop h6. He did not play bishop h6. But he did play bishop d4, which was good enough. <laughs> yeah, Klee got it. He did play bishop d4. And Black resigned. <laughs> yeah. So he, he, he found one of the three. Yeah, it's going to be mate in two. Queen takes c4 is the only thing you can do, really. Pawn takes, and then some mate on one of these squares. And white won. But again, not the cleanest game. And he gave black several chances to get back into the game. But again, fa phantom threats were really the issue there. 